we can get carbon through the air, right? But we got to start thinking more about getting carbon through water. And, uh, you know, we do have folks that tune into this. They use carbonated water. And now we sat down on our uh, Garden Talk podcast, podcast that that I have, and this was actually brought up, but it sparked a lot of controversy because we got people who are for it and people are against it. My question to you is, should you water your plants with carbonated water? No. Uh, And the answer is the CO2 being in the water is kind of like um, a can of soda being opened on a hot, sunny day. The CO2 just wants to go straight up and out. And if there's interactions between CO2 and minerals that are present inside of the water, you could get insoluble carbonates to be formed. So you can kind of like actually throw the feed water solution off balance by putting too much carbonated water in. Um, And and really the idea is not to put carbonated water, CO2, uh, inside of the um, feed water. The goal is to try to actually get the carbon reduced so that the oxygen isn't there or that the electron configuration is a little bit different. It's more about the configuration of the electrons than it is the distinct presence or lack of oxygen being there. Okay. One of the things I wanted to ask you about was the relationship between carbon and nitrogen in cultivation, particularly the C to N ratio. I heard some people kind of managing that. First of all, should people kind of monitor that level and how would they manage it? That is a great question. Um, It's a very important thing to manage for growers because what ends up happening is that nitrogen cannot be converted into an amino acid unless you have enough carbon skeletons present. And these are created in mitochondria. Basically, they're shuffled out. Uh, these skeletons that are basically like the spine of this molecule. And the head of the molecule is basically the amino acid. So plants are doing this balancing act. They say, I have the CO2 in the air and I have the NO3. And it, But in order to get the NO3 to be useful, I have to have the CO2 that's reduced as well. So it's a little bit of like they have to balance out the reduction power. They first have to create the organic acid skeleton, 2-oxoglutarate out of the mitochondria, and then that gets plugged in to the amino acids. So there's a balancing effect. Uh, And ultimately, I I think it's worthwhile to mention sulfur actually fits into the exact same um, paradigm because when you feed your plants like a magnesium sulfate or a potassium sulfate, the sulfate itself, SO4, kind of has the same problem going on. It has to have the oxygens removed from it in order to form... um, the reduced forms of sulfur that become the thiol groups that are present inside of cysteine. So all plants everywhere in the world, you give them sulfate. What they end up doing is they have sulfate uh, reduction pathways that will produce cysteine, just one amino acid cysteine. And now, you know, this is important because cysteine represents this convergent point between carbon reduction, right? We had CO2, but then we created an organic acid. We had nitrate, but then we created an amino acid. And then we had sulfate, and we also created a thiol group. So this one molecule cysteine, this one amino acid, represents what plants are capable of doing when they balance out uh, carbon reduction with nitrogen reduction with sulfate reduction. They get this one amino acid. And then from cysteine, it actually gets built up and out from there. So anytime we're talking about volatile sulfur compounds in certain species of plants, like um, garlic and onion do a really good job of producing these kinds of very, very potent molecules. They're not present in very high concentrations, though. Um, They have the parent forms that have thiol groups in them. And then once the parent forms are acted on, they release the aromatic compounds. But they're only released in terms of parts per trillion. So just to give you guys some perspective on that, you know, if you went and got some flour analyzed at a lab and you got the terpene concentrations on it, you might see 3 to 5% terpenes. Um, what you would see for volatile sulfur compounds is 0.0000001, or maybe there's an extra zero there. I don't know, you know, but yeah, so the point is basically it's such a small percentage that to think about feeding more sulfur to the plants and getting more sulfate, uh, or, or I'm sorry, feeding more sulfur to the plants and getting more thiols and skunky kind of terps back out is not as linear as that. It's more about gene expression and, uh, you know, to your earlier question about how carbon can be used to elicit certain genetic expressions, it's very, very true that certain forms of carbon act as signaling molecules for plants. In fact, the most abundant um, growth hormone produced by plants is uh, called auxin, and more accurately, it's called indole-3-acetic acid, and the acetic acid is the organic acid portion. So here we have an example of an organic acid-based molecule that functions to stimulate all plant growth Um, in every possible way. Auxins are like the chief primary growth hormones in plants. Um, Very, very important. If you knock auxins out of the plants, you don't get any plant growth. You can temporarily 
um, mess with auxin levels by chopping off the apical meristem, and then you promote lateral branching because you get more cytokinetic activity, but then auxin balance restores itself, and you have multiple heads competing for that auxin dominant position in the plants. Um, so, yeah, I mean, back to your question, Chris, the, the carbon to nitrogen ratio is really important if for no reason other than plants are also paying attention to the carbon to nitrogen ratio because that's what they need to have dialed in in order to make amino acids properly. They wouldn't do this thing of reducing the nitrates to an ammoniacal form and then not plugging the ammoniacal form into an organic acid. Because if you think about it, like nitrates, you can basically dump on your plants, right? You can feed them several hundred ppms, maybe close to a thousand ppms of nitrate. And it's fairly benign because it's kind of pH neutral. And as long as you have the right mineral load in the plants, it's not really going to create too much osmotic pressure. I mean, yeah, there, there are instant, you know, problems with it. But my point is that the nitrate can exist in super high levels within the plant without damaging them. But if you convert that nitrate to an ammoniacal form, that ammoniacal form very quickly builds up and it causes massive, massive damage to the plants, which is why you can't pee on your plants. They'll burn. You can dump nitrates on them. They don't burn, you know? <laughs> Interesting. <laughs> Uh, interesting uh, it, mm, <laughs> never try it uh no i haven't uh, yet uh, i got a member of my community that said it, he's done it and whatever swears swears you, you better have a super super healthy bladder and like every my yeah, this, diet would be yeah, very food. high levels of water uh, levels yeah. of, he probably dilutes it probably he, dilutes it perhaps yeah. I, I have no idea this is not a theory that i'm willing to salty die buds here. at the end of it that's right, brother. Nick, now I, I, I'm actually doing really good at following along. You're doing really well at, at, at laying this down in layman's terms, because uh, I, I, other than some of the the terms, you said something about a uh, an alopalical thing you chopped <laughs> off and made it go sideways. You, I, lo I don't understand that definition, but I got it. But anyways, m my question was, is that, and you might have actually touched on it. Uh, how are growers testing for carbon was that part of the question that chris asked and part of your answer i think that was with the files is like being able to test some of these these inputs so if it's by the it's surely by its outputting of 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 smell uh i mean humans are or remarkably taste? sensitive to volatile sulfur compounds and just for you know for like gasoline when you go and pump gas into your car that smell is actually not the gasoline that smell is i'm pretty sure it's a file um that they that's why i like gas billion. Yeah, exactly. It's why it smells gassy. Um, plants are can also produce similar compounds. But my point that I want to stress to people is that um, they're producing the parts per trillion. And most of the time we're feeding sulfates in the parts per million. We could feed, you know, 30 to 50 ppms of sulfur. So we're sitting um, thousands of times, uh, you know, we're feeding levels of sulfur that are thousands of times in excess of what the plants actually need. So this isn't about just like the plant is looking for a building block and you give it the building block and it's going to make this thing. That's not how it works. What, what ends up happening is that there's this genetic expression thing that has to happen where the plants first have to create an enzyme or express the enzyme because it's already baked into their DNA, maybe just not being expressed with salts. But if you take a more like holistic approach, full spectrum approach, you'll get these kind of signaling molecules that are carbon based that will then turn on certain expressions in the plants. And then all of a sudden you start to find this, this little bit of sulfur, not even a, a whole lot, but this little bit of sulfur then becomes utilized to produce something that contains thiols like um, um, skunky or, you know, a, a lot of times it's actually tropical fruits. Um, With like esters and stuff coming out instead of the thiols. That, that, that's one thing I was, people are arguing about the skunk one is they're saying I'm getting fruity. It's always fruity. And I'm thinking it's maybe the way they're feeding on top of our lighting on top. Like it's not far red. And it, it, it may have that genetic precomposition, but it's not being expressed because it's not being treated that way to bring that out potentially. This FTS clip was brought to you by AC Infinity, leaders in garden innovation. Use discount code the stash 15 at checkout to save some money on your order. From the Stash Podcast.